Good morning, folks. Walter Hudson here. Daniel Brighton Booker with me as well. Yeah. How are you doing this morning, Daniel? Good. How are you? Doing good. You're nice looking uh, much clearer. You're looking, what's that? Much clearer and less foggy. Much clearer. Like much have, clearer. And like I have a snazzy camera with a light on it. That's too bad. There you go. <laughs> now, actually, I think that that was better. That a little bit of extra juice in the uh, the old front light will do you some oh, good. You do, you do want the light on. Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Appreciate you joining us this Saturday morning, or whenever you're watching the recording after the fact. Again, my name is Walter Hudson. Uh, I am a candidate for state representative in the newly drawn 30A district, which includes Rockford Township, Hanover, St. Michael, Albertville and a huge chunk of Otsego west of Odin. Uh, so I'm joining you this morning along with Daniel uh, to give you an update on the campaign and also to talk about what I'm finding, um, both in terms of the conversations that I'm having with folks in the district uh, and also just through my own experience of not just running for office, but also engaging with local units of government um, on an issue of some importance. And in fact, you may have seen the previous video that Daniel and I did that was over on my personal channel um, talking about an issue in the local school district here in St. Michael Albertville um, that has really taken on a character and nature that I didn't anticipate. I didn't expect that that this issue would metastasize into what it has become. I mean, it's a relatively simple uh, matter of curriculum that ought to have been easy to deliberate and make a decision on. Um, and but we're going to talk about why that is the case, why it hasn't gone that way, um, which I think is kind of a microcosm of, and the reason why I'm bringing it over to the campaign channel now, um, as opposed to my personal channel, is because I think that that experience uh, gives us a look behind the curtain into some fundamental problems with our governing institutions that generate unnecessary discord and disunity uh, and frankly dysfunction. Um, people do not feel as though they're being represented uh, at any level of government, local, state, and federal. Um, this has been a, an ongoing continual problem for decades at this point. Um, you know, the, the last presidency, President Donald Trump was regarded and maligned as uh, a uh, disruptive force who was a uh, threat to unity or certainly a uh, antagonist to unity. And I think that that's an unfair characterization because it fails to recognize the frustrations that led us to a Trump presidency. Trump was a reaction to what I, what I believe is what we're gonna be talking about today. Like the, the phenomenon that I wanna kind of unpack here is something that's been building up for many years, decades in fact, and the tension that results from it is what gave us the Trump presidency and what has brought us to the point that we're at now. So um, we'll just go ahead and dive in and get started. Unless Daniel, you have any questions right off the bat, just from that intro that you'd like clarification on. Daniel's here as he was last time to kind of be your proxy as the audience. And um, if, he, if, if he doesn't follow what I'm saying, kind of be like, well, what do you mean by that? And uh, kind of back us up and get us on track. So what do you think of Daniel? No, I, uh, as I think I've said before, I have um, family that does not see the world like I do. And I tried actually explaining a number of times to um, numerous family members uh, about how <laughs> you don't, you seem to not understand that Obama pushed progressiveness and progressive policies so far that the pendulum had to come back and the pendulum coming back <laughs> was Trump. And then, uh, you know, I, I think it is a dangerous thing because uh, the pendulum seems to be swinging <laughs> now under Biden. 
the pendulum is swinging. Uh, I mean, he even stated, did he not, right when right when he got in, that he has the chance to be the most progressive uh, president since FDR. So the pendulum is swinging pretty far to the left again. And, uh, and I think that, you know, that obviously can happen at local levels and anything like that. But uh, the pendulum swinging extremely far each way uh, is is something that's potentially, you know, not good for society. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, it's certainly in runs contrary to a lot of what I hear from people when I talk to them um, out mm -hmm. on the campaign trail. So, you know, I'm an activist. I, I make no bones about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I come from an activist background. I'm a conservative. Mm -hmm. I'm unapologetic and way out front on that and make no apologies for it. Um, yet, yet I recognize that when you cross into this sphere, like I sit on the city council in Albertville, uh, so I'm responsible for governing along with my colleagues, public policy in the city of Albertville. Mm -hmm. And when I'm doing that, uh, that I have to be open to and willing to consider and weigh and evaluate perspectives that are not my own. Right. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that goes with the territory. Yeah. Um, does that, that doesn't mean that I'm going to compromise my convictions, but it does mean that I have to recognize um, when the best moments are to, to stand on particular Hills uh, and, and fight for them as opposed to recognizing that there's a, a better opportunity this way or that, or a, a better um, outcome to be sought in a given moment. And mm -hmm. that's, it's, I, that's what people seem to want. Um, you hear a lot about bipartisanship. You hear a lot about crossing the aisle. You hear a lot about uh, the, the lack of unity in our discourse. And I think the reason why you don't get that is because of what I'm gonna describe here today. So I just wanna go ahead and dive into it. All right. Sure. So, yeah. and, and I hate to start with the school board thing mm -hmm. uh, because I that it's such a charged issue that it's difficult to um, get people to just evaluate what I'm trying to express without attaching their uh, emotional allegiance to a particular side of the issue to it, but it is the best way to describe it, what's going on right now in STMA. So for those of you who may not know, um, there's an ongoing controversy in the St. Michael Alvarez School District involving a book that's being taught in the ninth grade English class called Speak by author Lori, Lori Holtz Anderson. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a book that, and I'm going to try to describe this in as, as neutral a fashion as I possibly can. Um, I don't think the proponents of the book would disagree with the description of it as a visceral account of sexual assault. Um, in fact, that's offered as one of the uh, value propositions of the book is that we should be teaching this to our 14, 15 year old students because it contains a, vis a visceral depiction of sexual assault and therefore provides us with the opportunity to talk about consent and sex and rape um, in the context of a high school classroom. Now, I personally, as a parent and a resident and a taxpayer, think that's insane um, for a wide variety of reasons, which I'm not gonna go into because that's not why we're here today. We're not here to um, litigate that question. What we're here to do is examine the process through which it is being litigated and to kind of extrapolate from that example, the problems that we see at all levels in government, including the state and, and federal government. So this issue was brought to my attention in late July. Uh, today, it's we're, we're in late September now, officially. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about two months ago. There have been four school board meetings between then and now. Um, at each of them, this book has become the center of public comment to an increasing degree, more and more people have been showing up mm -hmm. with their opinions one way or the other, including myself about this book. Um, I'm against it. I'm for it. It's terrible. It's great. 
and just in these three minute chunks, because that's the way the system is structured. The, the rules are that they're going to select three or four people from each side of a given issue and allot them three minutes each to speak. And um, once that's done, you know, it, they have occasionally, most of the time, they've taken like an informal poll of the room, asked people to raise their hands, asked people to stand to indicate which side of the issue they support. Otherwise, that's been it. There's been no discussion. There's been no response from the school board. There's been no deliberation in public. Now, what there has been is there has been a, uh, a reevaluation committee that's been formed. And that is a, a group of handpicked members of the community and uh, other stakeholders, school staff, parents, elected officials who have met in secret in order to deliberate a recommendation to present to the uh, superintendent, which she will then act upon. And ultimately that decision can and most likely will, regardless of what it is, be appealed to the school board. And so what this has manifested as the very slow, very procedural, very uh, unresponsive process where instead of having a debate out in the open, I mean, this reevaluation committee, which I've had uh, the privilege to attend as an observer, not as a participant. Uh, there have been two observers. I've been one representing parents, and the other has been a school staff member representing school staff, because apparently that's how this breaks down. We're turning this into a parents versus teachers thing. Um, <laughs> and I didn't do that. The parents didn't do that. The This process is doing that. Uh, and that's kind of my point, is that the way this should be working, the way all such issues should be deliberated is out in the open, in public, between the constituents and their elected officials in an open, recorded, broadcast, public meeting. And these issues should be, they should, they should be deliberated you can take as, as much of a procedural approach as you want. You can be as deliberate and drag it out as long as you want, but it should all be in the open so that people feel as though they are participants in the process and that their points are being heard. When mm -hmm. all you do is let people speak for three minutes a pop and then say, thanks for coming and move on to the next thing on your agenda. That's completely unrelated. And you do that for two months in a row at four different meetings. The, the effect of that, is that people are going to be extraordinarily frustrated and they're going to have an, an increasing sense of uh, futility and also urgency of what's going on here. Why mm -hmm. is nothing happening? Um, why why has nobody who I elected, why is nobody in those chairs up front who are our elected representatives, why aren't they saying anything? Why aren't they taking a mm -hmm. position? Why aren't they responding to what we're saying? Um, and there are answers to those questions that are rooted in policy and procedure. But guess who makes up the policy and procedure? The school board members, right? Like it's their policy. Like they, they have it within themselves to change it. And so I present that as an example, as a microcosm of a larger problem that manifests, especially at local levels of government, but also at the state level and the federal level. And what it is is this. And I'll give you another example. Yeah, go ahead. Would you say that the school board members uh, overwhelmingly side or lean to the side of all of the teachers, which is um, not conservative, I'm going to guess? So uh, I don't know. And that's... Part of the problem that's that's mm -hmm. the problem that i'm getting after is i can't tell you with any degree of certainty what a single one of those school board members think about anything mm -hmm. because they never say anything in a public setting um, and, and, well it's what 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 i have heard and what they would likely tell you is that it's first of all, they're going to defer to policy, which again, they said, okay. Mm -hmm. And the policy is, well, we don't respond to issues presented in open comment that aren't part of the agenda. You know, we don't mm -hmm. provide responses to that. Oh, okay. Well, why? 
Uh, and one of the rationales that you'll be presented with is, well, you know, the, the comments of an individual, because they're, they're also, from what I understand, discouraged from responding to emails um, or letters individually. What they'll do is, what's that? All right, they're discouraged from responding to emails? That's my understanding. Um, and the, cause what will happen when you send an email, let's say you send an email to a specific school board member and mm -hmm. say, and you know them by name, right? You say, Hey, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm going to make up a name. Hey, Bob, um, mm -hmm. I'm concerned about X, Y, or Z. What do you think? What you're going to get back is you're not going to get back an email from Bob. You're going to get an email back from the chair of the school board that says, thank you for writing. Um, the, our policy is to not respond individually to inquiries. Um, this, this may or may not be on the next agenda. You're welcome to show up to open comment. You know, it's just, it's this, def this deflection of responsibility from the individual elected official yeah. to actually tell you what they think about a given issue or a given policy. Hiding which behind that's, bureaucracy. <laughs> what's that? Hiding behind bureaucracy. Yes. Well, my my yes. sheet of paper says this, and therefore right. I have to do that. And now right. I am absolved of all conflict. Right. On a, on a you know heated issue, which seems yeah. incredibly cowardly. Well, I mean, look, it's the the our our school board members, uh, because I don't want to impugn motive here. Mm -hmm. They are following, and th and that's actually why I wanted to talk about this, because it's a it's an example of something that is indicative. It's it's systemic, and it manifests throughout local government, mm -hmm. uh, and the state and federal. What they are doing is they're they're following in the footsteps of those who have come before them. Um, these these policies and procedures th this. Uh, procedural response to things, um, this kind of sanitary insulated way of dealing with issues is a, a path that's been laid before them and that they've been told they should utilize and should go down. Mm -hmm. And the people who are telling them that are the people who they hire staff to administrate the process. <laughs> Um, I sit on the city council in Albertville. Okay. When I was first elected, I've been on there a cumulative seven years. Mm -hmm. When I was first elected, one of the first things they did was they sent me to a newly elected official orientation put on by an organization called the league of Minnesota cities. Mm -hmm. The league of Minnesota cities is what you might call like a trade organization um, of city staff, city administrators, city officials. <clears throat> and so what, what this was is, and I, you know, I didn't quite perceive it at the time because why would you when you're newly elected? Mm -hmm. what, this, what this is, is this is the staff collectively throughout the state coming together through their association to tame elected officials so that they won't rock the boat and they won't cause problems for staff. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what it is. Now, is there good information, um, valuable information provided by the league of Minnesota cities? Uh, it, it, is there, is there value in terms of the public policy participation deliberation that they offer unquestionably? Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not all bad here. However, the fact remains that they, they function, part of their function is to neuter elected officials by convincing them of all the things that they can't do. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the same, the same thing happens with school board members. There is a school board association. That's the same deal. It's a staff organization that neuters and tames and housebreaks school board members mm -hmm. and scares them about all the trouble they can get in if they don't stay in line if they don't do the if they don't go right down the middle 
and never express themselves and never defy the status quo. Um, and people innocently and without any sort of malicious motive or, or cowardice um, do what they're told and follow the advice because it's, it's presented in a manner that makes it sound extremely reasonable. Yeah. And when you're coming any it's, it's there's actually a rational component to this. If you're coming into a situation, which if I prevail in my campaign, I'm going to be in similar circumstances going into St. Paul for the first time as a uh, state representative. Mm -hmm. When you're walking into a situation where you don't know where the bathrooms are, right. Um, <laughs> you don't know all, all of the institutional ins and outs mm -hmm. where the proverbial bodies are buried. Mm -hmm. Um, rationally you're going to want to approach that with a certain sense of humility. Uh, and if somebody who's been there for 20 years comes along and says, listen, son, this is how things work. And you you really don't want to do what you just did. And you really don't want to say what you just said because X, Y, and Z, you would be wise to take what they say into serious consideration because they have more experience than you. Mm -hmm. And that that rational impulse is what is being played upon when these newly elected council members or county commissioners or school board members or whoever elected at the local level, when they go into these trainings put on by their staff's trade organization, that impulse of, hey, son, you're new to this. Let me let me do you a favor and tell you how it works. That is what is leveraged. Um, the ignorance of the of the newbie is mm -hmm. leveraged in order to, like I said, tame them, housebreak them, put them in a corner. Uh, and that's something that needs to change. Agreed. You you see this at the, and and this is this is indicative of a category of problem. Uh, that manifests at the state and federal level as well. Donald Trump called it the swamp. Mm -hmm. um, it's been referred to as the deep state. Mm -hmm. And what is meant when we talk about those things or when those things are invoked, what is meant is hirelings, people who were hired on mm -hmm. to work in government, to do the actual tasks of governing. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's, it's one thing, like legislators, council members, school board members, we're policy people. We deliberate ideas and then we approve policy. Mm -hmm. The people who actually implement that policy are hirelings. They are hired to do it. Mm -hmm. Administrators, bureaucrats, employees, staff members. And so if, if the implementation of the policy is not in accordance with uh, the intent of the policy, or if the specifics, like the rulemaking, um, when you when you get to like the state and federal level, the the rulemaking authority that's delegated to like the Department of Education uh, or the DNR or whoever, when they start to get act, start to actually be able to write the rules that are then implemented and enforced upon the public, at that point you no longer have the consent of the governed because the ones doing the governing are not those who consented to that person making that decision. Mm -hmm. they, elect, they elected a legislator. They elected a council member. They elected a board member, right? A commissioner. That's who they elected to make decisions. But instead, the decision is being made by an administrator. It's being made by a bureaucrat. It's being made by a hireling. And the higher up you go, you get to Washington, D.C., um, this process or, or this phenomenon is so calcified and uh, prolific, it's so widespread that Congress is all but entirely impotent. I mean, you combine this, you, you combine the delegation of responsibility that Congress uh, has committed, where they've given away their authority to all of these administrators and bureaucrats and departments and agencies. You combine that with the executive power that's increasingly taken by presidents of the United States, where they just write executive orders and say, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. There's not going to be a deliberation. There's not going to be a law. There's not going to be a bill. 
Mm-hmm. Those two things in, in combination have made Congress all but useless. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, you, you bring it back down to the state level. Okay. I'm running to be a state representative. What that should mean, what people think that means is that I am going to represent the district in which I live. I'm going to listen to the concerns and the priorities and the community standards that are prevalent in my community. And I'm going to take those to St. Paul and I'm going to, when, as we deliberate policy, as we look at bills, if we decide whether we're going to do this or that, as we're determining budget priorities, I'm going to take all those values that I soaked in when I was talking to people in the district. I'm going to apply that to the debate over what the policy ought to be, what the budget priorities ought to be. That's what people think being a state representative is. That's what it should be, (laughs) but it's not. All, that does happen. That process happens, but there's a complete disconnect between the the political theater of a regular legislative session, where you have committee hearings and floor debates, uh, and and this conversation in the media about this idea or that idea, and whether we ought to go left or right. There's a complete disconnect between that and how the ultimate decision actually gets made. Because the ultimate decisions are actually being made by legislative leadership and by the governor in a couple of different ways. One is through omnibus bills, where instead of having a a deliberation about this particular idea and that particular idea, this, this specific bill and that specific bill, instead of doing that, we're taking all of these things and we're bundling them up into this giant legislative sausage. Mm hmm. Of, of wholly unrelated crap. Yeah. Um, and we're putting that in front of representatives and we're saying yay or nay mm-hmm. on, on everything. The, the question that's being presented to legislators is, do you want to have a government or not? And we saw this last session where they weren't able to complete their work and everybody's frustrated Mm-hmm. Um, because nothing got done. Well, it's <laughs> it's not because nothing could get done, right? Mm-hmm. Like you could have had a bill that does X and a bill that does Y and a bill that does Z, and it could have been worked on, signed, deliberated, passed individually. But instead, it comes down to all this omnibus nonsense where the question is presented to legislators, are we going to have a government, yes or no? And it leads to this this government shutdown brinksmanship that has become a, a regular part of life in Minnesota, uh, of yeah. whether or not we're going to shut the government down for a lack of being able to come to agreement. To clarify, um, I know that for a long time, and maybe other people are thinking as well, the everyone always hears about this phrase, the omnibus bill. And I believe you just explained it, but I would say for anyone listening, uh, Specifically, the omnibus bills, omnibus, omnibus, <laughs> B-U-S, omnibus, B-U-S, bill, yeah, bus. yeah, is uh, where everything just gets packaged in to one thing instead of separate, separate bills. I just thought I would be the yep. proxy right there in case people missed that because I know that. I don't remember when, but you know, some time ago, I was like, what? "Why?" I, I keep hearing this strange word, and you right. hear it all the time. But yeah, I just thought I would say, clarify that uh, what exactly no. the omnima, omnibus bill is whenever you hear about it. Yeah, no, I very much appreciate that because it is important that people understand that that's the way the process works. And so when, when you get to that point where nothing happens in the regular session, it ends up going to a special session. Mm-hmm. And the special session declared by the governor, called by the governor, um, puts him or her in a position where they have so much more power than they do during the regular session because they get to decide whether there's even going to be one, right? And so what they do is they say, look, if you want a special session, then we're going to have to come to an agreement as to what's going to happen in it. It's like overtime where yeah. <laughs> there's new rules. Right. And yeah, everything changes. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, 
And so what that does is it is it enables the the governor to take the legislative leadership into a back room where there is no public open mm-hmm. deliberation, mm-hmm. kind of like this reevaluation committee. There is no public discussion about the issues, and they come to a to a decision about literally everything, mm-hmm. budget, policy, government in the state of Minnesota is all decided by five people, mm-hmm. and they come they come out of that room with omnibus bills or a bill and go back to their members and say, we're going to pass this Mm -hmm. and he's going to sign it. And so that what you have there is the complete and utter breakdown of representative democracy. And the great irony here is that this is, this is happening. You know, Minnesota is, has been a blue state governed by the DFL governed by Democrats who present themselves as champions of democracy and are consistently uh, going on with their rhetoric about the importance of people's votes being counted and democracy being adhered to and people being represented and how important all those things are. And those things are important, which is why it's perplexing that none of them are happening functionally. Mm -hmm. There's a giant show being put on that makes it look like you are being represented through some sort of democratic process. Mm -hmm. But in, in actuality, in reality, in terms of how decisions are actually being made and how government government is actually being administered, your opinion doesn't matter at all. And if you don't believe me, if you want to get a taste of this, go down to your local hireling at any level of government and ask them uh, uh, object to something. Find something worth objecting to and then go down and talk to your local hireling about what it is that you have an objection to. The attitude that you're going to get on the whole, there certainly are exceptions, but on the whole, the attitude that you're going to get is dismissive, condescending. You'll you'll have things like audible sighs, rolling of eyes. uh, and, And if you push it, if you keep showing up, like parents here in St. Michael Alberville have been doing with the issue we started off describing. If you keep showing up, eventually that dismissal and condescension and pats on the head is going to turn into open hostility mm-hmm. and, and working against you, campaigning against you as a constituent, as a, as a, a private person, that'll happen. Um, and what that tells me, because, you know, that's if you go if, in the private sector, you walk into a, a business and you have a complaint. Nobody's going to treat you that way mm-hmm. ever. And the reason why is because they depend upon, they actually are responsive to you. The, the private sector does a better job of representing you than the public sector does mm-hmm. because they actually care what you think because it matters to them. It affects their bottom line. It affects their, their, their livelihood. That's not true in the public sector. They're going to get paid no matter what. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> which the, the, there's kind of a tangential issue here of term limits and the idea behind term limits, which is a noble idea. The idea that uh, we, we shouldn't have career politicians. We shouldn't have people who make their livelihood off of government. Mm-hmm. But what term limits as presented does is it completely ignores the actual nature of government because the the reason why your government is not functioning properly has very little to do with who you're electing and very, and and everything to do with the people who administer it without ever being elected. Mm -hmm. The people who have lifetime appointments by virtue of having been hired, Mm -hmm. you know, people who are going to retire and get pensions off the state. Those are the folks that are the source of the problem. And so if you want to have, term limits in a effective practical sense then you need to term limit out the employees right there needs to be there needs to be a limit on how long you can work for government not just Um, how long you can serve it that just made me think of something and i don't know if there is an answer to this or if you know the answer to this but maybe it's something to try to find um how often can newly elected officials for lack of a better term, fire the 
<laughs> deep state. Like, cause I mean, that would seem to be, uh, you know, if, if, um, you, if the, if the citizen, if the caring citizens who take the time to get out to vote, put the people in that they want there, if those people that are then elected to their positions basically have no, uh, no authority to get rid of the deep state or, uh, the syndicate to use one of my favorite shows of all time, the X-Files. If there's no way to get rid of those people, uh, that seem that seems like a pretty huge roadblock to make change. If you can't get rid of the the bureaucrats that have just been hired, you know, 20 years ago and are still there. Right. Well, and that and that's the problem, right? So, you know, going back to using Donald Trump as a as an example, mm -hmm. um, Trump Trump ran on draining the swamp mm -hmm. and opposing the deep state, opposing the administrative state. The problem was that you, that past a certain point when you have uh, a cancer, you have to cut out the larger healthy body that it is oh. infested, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing left to salvage past a certain mm -hmm. point. Yeah. And I think with I think with a lot of these agencies and departments, that's where we what we've got where we've gotten to is we've gotten to the point where uh, d does does the Department of Education at the federal level um, serve some positive functional role? Maybe. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all of the malignant uh, impacts that it has on the capacity, because. What, what is it that we're getting after with education? What's the point of education? The point of education generally is to prepare students to successfully negotiate reality, to provide them with the knowledge and skills necessary for them to go out into the world on their own, form their values, decide what they want to do with their lives and what they're seeking, and then to successfully pursue it mm -hmm. in, a, in a healthy, life-affirming manner that results in them thriving so, they, so we can have a better generation for posterity, right? Like, that's the point of education. And when you distill that down to the individual level of, like, what, what does a parent want for their child? As parents, we want our children to be happy. We want them to be safe. We want them to be productive. We want them to be challenged. We want them to be able to rise to the challenge and to overcome it. That's what we want. And so, and we are the final arbiters of how that happens and the, the particulars of it, like how it manifests. And so if we're going to have a department of education, then its purpose must be aligned with that purpose. And yet it's not. No. The, the department of education almost exists it's seemingly to do the opposite. I mean, just look at academic outcomes, right? Um, look, look at how poorly students are doing on the whole. And then, then ask like, what, how, how is that a measure of success? But then beyond that, when you get into the particulars of things like comprehensive sex education, um, critical race theory, the, this deal, this issue that we're dealing with locally here in SCMA with the book with visceral depictions of rape being put in mm -hmm. front of 15 year olds, um, those are things that very aggressively and invasively cross, like oppose the parental educational mandate, which is, I want my kid happy. I want my kid safe. I want my kid prepared to be able to go out and negotiate reality and deal successfully with the world. That, that you're, you're tossing all these stumbling blocks in front of them by teaching them to judge each other according to the color of their skin uh, and, and, and rubbing their noses and all this sexual filth and perversion in the name of education. N none of that is necessary. That's counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And and so if, if that is the type of stuff that is manifesting from a department like the Department of Education, then that department needs to go away. I think we can get by without it. Like whatever, whatever positive functions it's fulfilling, I'm sure we can figure out a way to take care of those things at a more local and more accountable level. And 
again, it's it's not just about being local either, because as we started off talking about, we we have local issues. Uh, even here in wonderful conservative Wright County, we mm-hmm. have local issues with our school districts. Our neighbors here, they're actually part of my uh, legislative district, 728 Elk River School District. There's a slate of candidates who are running, who are running on this. They're running on your, your district needs to be transparent. It needs to be accountable. It needs to listen to you. Um, and so this is a problem everywhere, including at the local level. And what we need to do and why I'm making this part of my campaign, why this is a campaign live stream, mm-hmm. is because I think there are changes that we can make at the state level to – because we already have the open meetings law, right? So as, as a, a, a city council member – here in Albertville, I can't just go down to, to the bar to Willie McCoy's here off of 19 and mm-hmm. sit with two of my fellow council members and hang out. I can't mm-hmm. do that because that's a quorum of the city council. And we could be sitting there talking shop and deciding how we're going to vote at the next meeting outside the view of the public. That would be a violation of the law and we can get in serious trouble for doing that. Hmm. Um, that <laughs> principle needs to be applied more broadly. I, I think I think we need to have I think we need to implement aspects of that at the state level, at federal level as well. Um, but it also needs to be expanded to include things like this reevaluation committee. Like I actually question whether or not it's legal to have a committee that discusses public policy, which is, you know, curriculum, right? The curriculum at a public school is public policy. So you've got this group of people appointed by the school board um, to discuss an issue and provide them with a recommendation on policy, but that discussion isn't going to be out in the open where people can hear it. That doesn't sound right. No, but it it is what it is. That's what they're doing. Um, And so that type of stuff needs to go away. What also needs to go away over here in Buffalo, your neck of the woods, Buffalo, Hanover, Montrose. I'm just going to, rock all the boats in the district today. <laughs> uh, all three all three school districts. Um, <laughs> Buffalo, Hanover, Montrose. They just passed a policy restricting open comment at their school yeah. board meeting. <laughs> what? Mm-hmm. Like, that's why you're there. That's literally why you're there. The, yeah. You, As a school board, as a city council, as a state legislature, the only reason why we exist as public officials is to interact with the public and to Mm -hmm. be a voice of the public. We can't do that if we don't listen to the public, right? If we're we're not going to, if we're not going to take questions, if we're not going to respond with our sincerely held beliefs, um, if we're not going to provide people, I mean, you, this, this manifests in the ballot box. You go to, when we go to vote in November, you'll go in there and you'll cast your vote for governor. You'll cast your vote for, for your uh, state legislators, then you're going to get down to city council. You're going to get down to school board. You're going to get down to county commissioner and judges. And you're going to be like, I don't know who any of these people are. I don't know who any of these people are. And to the extent that I do maybe have seen the name before, I can't tell you what they think about anything because they've never had to disclose it. They've never been presented with with a scenario where where they were called to the carpet and said, "Tell us wh- who you are, what you believe, what you think, and what you're going to do." Mm-hmm. They're, they're they're shielded from having to make a decision and having to explain themselves. Mm-hmm. That needs to change. It needs yeah. to change. It needs to change with city council members, with county board members, with school board members, um, with judges, with county commissioners, everything, everybody. There, there need to be processes in place which force elected officials to disclose where they're at on matters of public policy in a manner which makes which makes them accountable. Like the purpose of it, because the reason why it doesn't happen is because, well, if I say something, then I'm going to upset people. Yeah, you will. Happens to me every day. It's going to happen to me. It's going to happen to me as a result of this. Guaranteed. But you know why I do it anyway, even though nobody's holding the gun to my head? Because I, I operate under the conviction that it's appropriate for people to know who their elected officials are and what they think and what they believe. 
whether you oh. agree with me or not. The pe- the people who go into into the ballot um, box on uh, in November on election day and vote against me for state representative, they're going to know precisely what they are voting against because I've made it extremely clear. Mm. And and on the flip side, the people who go in and vote for me are going to know precisely what they're voting for because I've made it clear. That's the way it is supposed to be. You should, you should, you shouldn't, if, if you're afraid of losing because people are going to know who you are and what you believe, then this isn't for you. Okay. you the, the appropriate attitude um, as a political candidate for any office is I'm going to, I'm going to be who I am and I'm going to stand on my convictions and I'm going to represent my community. And that's either what the people want or it isn't. And if it isn't, I'll go do something else. And that's okay. Uh, that made me think of a, I had the grandiose idea of putting on my website, all of the candidates that everybody in Wright County will see. Um, and I need to, obviously I would need help to, to be able to know which names, but putting on my website, every single candidate that every ballot in Wright County, every Wright County voter would see that would align with conservative values. And then my other thought was how many, I, I think, I wonder if people are hiding behind, because how many of the positions that you vote for on these ballots, like in the midterms and anytime really, are supposedly nonpartisan. Like I know our Jeremiah Patrick running for mayor here, who I've been trying to help and who we're going to do another podcast with here in the next week. I mean, I believe our position here in Buffalo mayor is supposedly supposed to be nonpartisan and then commissioners and is your position supposed to be nonpartisan or are you allowed to on the city council? Yes. Um, Okay. So I feel like that's kind of like, that's, that's another roadblock that where, you know, if it's, if it's supposedly a nonpartisan spot, then that gives people basically the ability to go, well, I can't rock the boat. I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to put my signs out. I mean, so, and, and I can't claim to know uh, comprehensively what's, what's behind the partisan nonpartisan distinction. Mm -hmm. But my, my belief is that all that means is that you don't run as a Republican or a Democrat or a libertarian. You don't run as a party candidate for those yeah. offices. That, that is all it means. It does not mean that you can't seek the support of whatever political party or multiple political parties. And that happens, you know, in, in Minneapolis, I believe when they, you go down the, the list of candidates for um, council, mayor, whatever, you'll, you'll see green party candidates and yeah. marijuana party candidates and, and what have you. And, and I don't know if that's just a function of their charter is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, but my point is, is that there, there is nothing keeping candidates from associating themselves with one party or another. But to me, I mean, it's that, I mean, that would, sure. Does that help? Does being able to like, when you go, cause not everybody who walks into the ballot box uh, in November is going to know who I am or know who my opponent is. But they'll know what the R means, and they'll know what the D means, right? And they'll vote accordingly. Um, and so, would would that help at the local level? Maybe. Uh, but I think that there's limitations to that, right? So, if you're voting for the R or the D rather than the person, then you're making a lot of assumptions about what that person stands for based on that R or that D. Mm -hmm. And those assumptions may or may not be correct. Mm -hmm. Uh, And rather than have, rather than import that into the local level, I think it makes more sense and would provide healthier debates and, and through extension, healthier policy. If people were able to associate values with the actual name of the person on the ballot. Mm-hmm. And the only way you're ever going to be able to associate values with the name of the person on the ballot is if that person opens their mouth and tells you what they think. Mm-hmm. 
And that's not typically how local elections go. Usually it's, it's about, you know, look at me and my pretty family and how good I look in a suit or a, a, a <laughs> pantsuit or whatever. Um, and look at my resume. Uh, I've done this, I've done that. Aren't I grand? It's like mm -hmm. a beauty pageant, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's what it is. Tell us, tell us uh, what your hobbies are. Um, and when that's the basis on which you're selecting the people who are forming your policy, boy, talk about a grab bag. You have no idea what you're going to get. Yeah. And that's oh. where we're at. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that there need to be, that we, we need to, and when I, and when I think about, because this, these municipalities, the counties, the state, or I'm, I'm sorry, the counties, the cities, the uh, school districts, all of them derive their authority from the state of Minnesota. And so as a legislature, uh, we have the capacity to go in and change the rules of how these governing institutions look and how they function. And mm -hmm. that, that's what the open meetings law is. It's an intervention that says, no, you can't, you can't meet down at the VFW and decide what the budget's going to be. You know, like you're, you have to do that in public open meeting. Mm -hmm. um, and so we can we can make reforms. And I think one of them is mandating open comment periods mm -hmm. where we where we say, look, you shall listen to what people have to say and you shall provide a response individually, not collectively, not something where like the the chair or the mayor or whoever's the the head person of the body puts together like a communal sanitized response i want to know what that guy thinks and what that gal thinks and what this guy in the middle where he's at and you know each of them in turn can sit there and and hide behind ambiguity and say well i don't know i got to think about it but then even that at least then even there you have in answer Right. Yeah. Like you have something that you can follow up on and say and, and get back to that person and say, well, what, what's your problem? What do you need? What do you mm -hmm. not know? How can I help you arrive at a decision on this? Mm -hmm. As it stands, you don't even know who you should be talking to. Mm -hmm. how, how can you have representative government in that scenario where you don't even know who thinks what or where people are at or how to assist them? It, it takes all the good faith out of it. And, and there is no other institution, there is no other human endeavor that we engage in that functions this way. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to go to work, wh whatever your employment happens to be. You're not going to go to work and have a work meeting where one side gets to speak for three minutes and the other side thanks them for coming and then they go off and do their own thing. Like that's not going to, you're not going to be able to function. Yeah. There needs to there needs to be communication. There needs to be interaction. There needs to be deliberation and it needs mm -hmm. to be collaborative. And you know, getting back to the point about unity and why can't we all just get along? The reason why we can't all just get along is because we're not having those conversations. That that's why I'm doing this. The the reason why I'm doing live stream and, and intend to continue, you know, uh, Assuming I prevail in November um, with the support of voters in this district, I intend to continue making myself available for these sorts of things um, and making it very clear where I stand on issues. Yeah, where I'm at. Because, because people deserve it, mm -hmm. because it's the right thing to do, and because it's healthy. It'll, it allows us to work out our issues, quite literally. Um, when, when all you have, and, and, and we all know this in our personal lives, if you've got a, if you have tension, if there's tension between you and a family member or you and a friend or you and a coworker and you never, ever talk about it ever, you just let that, you just let it set and fester and you just sit there and, and you kind of mope around in your own thoughts about it and your own assumptions about where they, it's going to blow up. Mm -hmm. And that's what has happened. That is what has happened in American democracy is we have not been having good faith, open deliberations, meaningful debates in public forums 
about various issues at all levels of government. And because we're not having those conversations, all, all every side, each side does of any given issue is goes in their corner and mopes about it and, and goes into, onto social media and riles each other up about, oh, I'm so mad about X. Oh, I'm so mad about Y. And there's no release valve for it until it spills out into the street. Yeah. Which is what we've seen happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you've got these <clears throat> that the activists, and again, I am an activist. I make no apology for that. But it's one thing to be an activist as an elected official because there's an inherent check on my activist impulses called mm-hmm. an election, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is we've got a bunch of activists as hirelings now in government who are running departments and uh, crafting rules and authoring academic standards and what have you. Uh, and so there's no check on that activist impulse. And so when you talk about the pendulum swinging from left to right and, and it becoming more drastic with each swing, the reason that's happening is because there is, there is no check on, the, you know, people talk about the fringes and extremism and radicalism. There's no check on that because you've institutionalized it. You, you removed it from the deliberative process. You removed it from the craft of governing and placed it in the halls of bureaucracy where it can thrive like a bacteria in a Petri dish. (laughs) So that when we talk about draining the swamp, that's what we're talking about. We got to get rid of that. We have to diminish the impact and governing power of the higher and reclaim the impact and governing power of constituents and their elected officials. That That's what I want to do. We the people. <laughs> yes. I think that's a, yeah, I think that's a, a pretty significant phrase in the founding of the country. We the people. <laughs> right. Um, I don't know if there's some technical issue. I know that I, have some uh, had some unforeseen equipment difficulties this morning, but I have not been able to see or verify um, any sort of live chat or comments. So I don't know if people have been watching uh, mm-hmm. or had any responses. Um, so if you ha- if you have been leaving comments, I apologize for not being able to address those live here. Um, you know, I'll go back and and try to address them to the best of my ability in the comment sections themselves. But I thank everybody for watching this. And I thank you, Daniel, for joining me um, this morning. I think I'm going to try to get out and and do some uh, on the ground shoe leather campaigning today. So I want to cut this, cut this uh, right here at at about an hour. Um, Are there any final thoughts or questions that you want to toss out there? No, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I think uh, just the whole idea of getting uh, getting citizens and people back involved in what yeah. is going on um, on issues that specifically revolve around the neighborhood and the city that you live in. Uh, and I've said many times that I'm, I'm kind of dealing with this right now, not not too terribly uh, big, but um, back in June, the uh, the when I started my website and the podcast, uh, apparently it it uh, it made its way to one of the Buffalo community pages, and there were a lot of a lot of upset people saying that uh, you know logical and right is. Uh, uh, hateful and every word you could possibly think of that comes our direction as conservatives and uh you know the yeah the 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 plague of keyboard warriors on social media is not helping anything in society and getting back to something like this and uh you know town halls and get face to face conversation what happened to that in the real world yeah, I mean, and look, I, I'm one of those keyboard warriors, right? Unquestionably, um, 
and it's I it's I recognize the inherent limitations of that format. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is not a place to go and convince people. <laughs> no. Um, it is not a place to. I mean, it certainly has its utility. I mean, that's why I why I'm there and why I keep doing it is that it the function that it serves is to uh, kind of get the if, for people to present their starting points, right? Mm-hmm. So, in any debate, the first task is to formulate an accurate understanding of what each side claims or mm-hmm. wants. And social media is really good for that. It's really good for for staking out your ground, planting your flag, and saying, this is where I'm at. This is what I believe. This is why I believe it. Mm-hmm. What it's terrible at, um, what it's terrible at is being able to do any sort of reconciliation. Once, you, once you've established those things, it's terrible at being able to actually like work through the differences and compare and contrast and try to understand where the other person is coming from. And it that's because of the nature of it. It's it's it very much rewards, you know, with the likes and the comments and all of that. It very much rewards affirmation of what you said rather than challenge of what you said. Mm-hmm. Um and so we can't we can't be having our we can't be deciding things on social media. And, and the only way we're going to get away from that is by deciding them in a public forum with elected officials the way it's supposed to work. Mm-hmm. By having community meetings, by having public meetings, by bringing people into a room and having the discussion out in the open and not just for three minutes at a time, but in depth, going through things, chewing it over, digesting it, learning mm-hmm. something about each other, right? Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the, the way the system is currently structured, that's not going to happen. And so we need to change how it's structured. So I'm behind you. <laughs> I appreciate it. Appreciate everybody listening. Hudson for MN.com is where you can go to find out where I stand on things. And, uh, there'll be plenty of opportunities to, um, try to flesh that out and have deliberation down the road. So appreciate it. And um, we'll do this again soon, Dan. And thank you as always. Absolutely. Look forward to it. Take care. Bye.